Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of our homecoming lecture series. We're glad to have all of you here today. Before we begin, I just want to remind our attendees that you can share and submit questions using the Zoom webinar Q&A feature. In today's session, when race, prisons, and COVID collide, Georgetown's Prisons and Justice Initiative, we are joined by Professor Mark Howard. Mark Howard is one of the country's leading voices and advocates for criminal justice and prison reform. He is a professor of government and law and the founding director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative at Georgetown University. He is also the founder and president of the Frederick Douglass Pro Project for Justice, a nonprofit organization that launched in 2020. His Prisons and Justice, Prisons and Punishment course has become one of the most sought after courses at Georgetown and his Making an Exoneree course received national attention after aiding in the exoneration of Valentino Dixon, a man wrongfully convicted of murder who had served 27 years in prison. Howard received his BA in ethics politics and economics from Yale University, his MA and PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, and his JD from Georgetown University. Join me in welcoming Professor Mark Howard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kayla. Uh, and thank you all for joining the Zoom event today. Um, I can't see you, uh, but it's great to know that so many Georgetown alumni are interested in learning about what your alma mater is doing to contribute to criminal justice and prison reform. Uh, and as my former students who are watching know, I usually like to walk around and, and move my arms when I'm lecturing, but I'm gonna do my best to be entertaining while I'm confined to my chair here, staring at a green light on my computer. Let me start um, by saying that I spend most of my waking hours and frankly, many of my sleeping hours, and there aren't that many of them, unfortunately, um, every single day trying to do three things. The first is trying to get people out of prison who don't belong there. And that includes both wrongfully convicted people, and there are far too many of them, but also people who have transformed and don't pose a public safety risk. Second, I work to try to help rehabilitate and support people on their journey of personal transformation. And we do that through our Georgetown education programs, both in prison and jail through the Prison Scholars Program, and also for returning citizens, formerly incarcerated people through the Pivot and Paralegal Programs. And third, I work hard to try to change the public narrative about incarceration. In just about everything I do write or talk about, I'm trying to move from a language of demonization to one of humanization and to thinking about them to rather about us. And I'm also doing that through my new nonprofit organization, the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. But let me take a step back here and say that it wasn't always this way for me. In fact, this is actually a relatively recent move. And I consider this in some sense a second career because I was hired at Georgetown in 2003 as a political scientist who specialized on European politics. Um, I'm actually half French. I'm a dual citizen of the US and France and have grown up in both countries with both languages as native tongues. I also lived in Germany and in Russia and speak both of those languages fluently. And I wrote two books and a number of articles that dealt with that part of the world, first Eastern Europe and then questions of immigration in Western Europe. And that had nothing to do with the United States nothing to do with criminal justice. That's what I was trained in, that's what I was hired to do, and that's really what I did for the first part of my career. But I had a personal connection to criminal justice in prisons that went from initially being an entertaining story that I would sometimes share with people to really becoming the dominant force and mission in my life. And actually, I'm gonna start sharing my screen now, and I'm gonna tell a story um, about where it began. Um, and so, Bear with me one second. And now you should all be able to see my screen. Um, and the story actually starts with a childhood friend. Uh, his name is Marty Tancliffe. And uh, we've known each other since we were three years old. We actually went to the same preschool, a place called Lovey Dovey Preschool. And then we went to elementary, middle school, and high school. We weren't always close friends throughout, but we were always on good terms. And on the first day of our senior year of high school, we both just turned 17 years old. Um, we're born nine days apart. And uh, something terrible happened. Marty woke up to find his parents brutally murdered. And by the end of that day, he was in handcuffs and arrested. And then the next summer convicted 
of murdering his parents. And he was sentenced to 50 to life, 50 years to life in a maximum security prison in New York. Now, I believe that Marty was innocent and I wrote about it um, in our um, high school newspaper that was called the Purple Parrot, which looking back is actually the only paper in all of New York that actually got the story right, which is that Marty was innocent. Um, it was his father's business partner who hired hitmen to kill Marty's parents and also probably paid off a police detective to frame Marty, but that's a long sorted story that we don't have time to get into. Um, but so Marty and I went in different directions, um, but we reconnected later, not long after I came to Georgetown. And um, I heard about some developments with this case and I reached out to him and I started visiting him in prison and um, meeting with his legal team and actually writing a brief on behalf of our high school classmates about an issue that was very important um, that was unaddressed by his original trial attorney. And I made him a promise in the prison visiting room that I would do everything I could to help get him out of prison, that I would never give up on him, no matter how long it would take. And then I made a decision that most people around me thought was crazy, which was that I was gonna to go to law school to get my friend Marty out of prison. And I decided that I was gonna to go to Georgetown where there's a great benefit package for faculty members where you can do eight semesters of tuition free education. No one was ever crazy or stupid enough to do that as a law degree, but I became the first to do that. And um, just before I started, Marty was exonerated and it was an incredible moment um, by the way, this photo right here is of us just like an hour after he left prison. He'd served over 17 and a half years and he just walked out at that moment. And I actually, um, I just started a sabbatical semester in Paris and I flew back to be there at the moment when he got out and it was extraordinary. Now, most people who knew me thought, okay, well, Marty's out. Now you're gonna go back to work on European politics, but I couldn't. And instead I continued with law school and then I ended up completely rededicating my professional and some extent personal life to criminal justice and prison reform. And the way I put it is that through Marty's case, my eyes had been opened to injustice and I couldn't close them again. And so fast forwarding a number of years and skipping some interesting parts of the story in the connection with Marty, is that Marty who himself has recently become a lawyer too and we're both members of the New York bar. He's now joined the Georgetown family and after many years of giving guest lectures in my class, that was always a highlight for my students, he and I began co-teaching a class together where our students reinvestigate wrongful conviction cases. And as Kayla mentioned, we were able to exonerate and contribute to the exoneration of Valentino Dixon. Um, and this is literally five minutes after Valentino Dixon walked out of prison after 27 years wrongfully convicted, most of those years in Attica prison, one of the worst prisons in the country. And here are the two students who worked on his case and Marty and I at the celebration of his exoneration. Now I'm gonna say more in a little bit and I'm gonna show you a short video that actually gets um, into that story and what we do in that class. But I also wanna say that my work goes beyond the issue of wrongful convictions. That's certainly where it started. It started with Marty and then it's expanded with other exonerees, um, but it goes also to embrace the so-called guilty, people who have made mistakes, people who I believe deserve the chance to prove that they can change, people who have earned the right to return to society and become productive and successful citizens. So in 2014, I started volunteer teaching at a maximum security prison in Maryland. And then in 2018, my Georgetown initiative, the Prisons and Justice Initiative, launched a major prison education program at the DC jail. We're now offering credit bearing courses and will soon offer a Georgetown bachelor's degree to incarcerated students. And here we have a photo um, from our end of semester celebration in December, 2019. And you'll see President DeJoya here, along with the director of the Department of Corrections and associate director, um, I'm right behind them there, and a mix of our incarcerated students and outside students. We actually had several courses that met at the DC jail. Credit bearing courses were both Georgetown students from the hilltop and incarcerated Georgetown students would take the same class together. It's the first time it's ever been done in the country. We also have the only co-educational mixed gender prison education program in the country where we have incarcerated women in our classes along with incarcerated men. Now, the experience of teaching in prison has brought me together with the tremendous humanity that is locked away from society, forgotten and really abandoned, often for many decades 
under conditions that are unimaginable. And I've learned through that experience so much about the utter cruelty and heartlessness that plagues this country in terms of how we treat the less fortunate among us. And it's made me a true believer in the power of prison education, which changes people's lives and makes society safer. And also by bringing in outside visitors, and by now I've brought in over a thousand Georgetown students, hundreds of guest speakers and observers, many of them are my colleagues or other leaders in business or sometimes celebrities like Kim Kardashian West. By bringing them inside of prisons, they've all walked out and said that the experience was eye-opening and usually life-changing. And now I'm committed to breaking down the ignorance and inhumanity surrounding prisons. And that's the main purpose and objective of my nonprofit organization, the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice, which is gonna scale the work that I've been doing within Georgetown and in the DC area on a national level, facilitating prison visits for people all around the country. And I hope for many of you alumni who are in different places far from DC missing the hilltop, will be able to get involved and experience some of the magic that we're producing through our prison visitation program that will take place once COVID is passed in other areas of the country. But now I wanna take a step back. So that's kind of the personal story and the origins of the work that I'm doing that we're doing in Georgetown. But since this is billed as a class and I'm a professor, what I wanna do is take a step back and I wanna give you a sense of the American criminal justice and prison systems. So I'm gonna put my professor hat on here. And then afterwards, I'm gonna focus on what Georgetown is doing about it. So I wanna go through some slides and give you a sense of just how devastating and problematic the criminal justice system in the United States is. Now, in comparative perspective, we have 5% of the world's population, but nearly 25% of the world's prison population. That's a staggering number when you think about it. One quarter of prisoners in the world are in the United States, despite having 5% of the population. Looking at it here in terms of a map, where you see that countries that have higher prison population rates per capita are in the sh red shaded areas. The US is totally off the charts, higher than any country in the world. Russia is the only one that comes close. And when you look at comparable countries to the US, where the US typically fits in, like Canada, Western Europe, Australia, Japan, it's night and day. They're very different universes in terms of incarceration. Now, it wasn't always this way. If you go back in time a little bit, back to 1971, almost 50 years ago, you'll see that the US had incarceration rates that were actually quite comparable to other advanced democracies. These are a set of European countries for which we have data going back to 1971. And you'll see that suddenly something shifted in the mid 1970s. A lot of this had to do with the war on crime of the Nixon administration, then moving into the war on drugs in the Reagan administration, but also, and let's be honest here, I know we're all Hoya alumni, but more people went to prison during the two terms of President Bill Clinton, Georgetown's most famous alumnus, than under any other president in history. And so it continued to increase and it has slightly gone down with a peak around 2010. But when you compare it to the other countries, it stayed flat and something different has happened in the United States. And suddenly what went from being a little bit higher is now completely different. We incarcerate people at seven to 10 times higher rates than other countries in the world. Now, I know many of you are thinking it must be higher crime. It must have been an increase in crime that explains this. Well, wrong. If you look at crime rates, and this is using Gallup data from 2000, comparative crime rates in terms of the likelihood of victimization of crime, the US is actually very average, maybe even slightly lower than average compared to the same set of countries, advanced industrialized countries. And that includes both violent and nonviolent crimes. So there's this myth out there because there's a lot of noise about it, about crime, 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 but crime rates in the US are actually, let's just say relatively average compared to other comparable countries. The one exception to that I have to mention is homicide, which has to do of course with the wide prevalence of guns where both homicide and suicide rates are much, much higher in the US due to the easy availability of guns. Now, 
I want you to zoom in here on the US a little bit. And I want to give you a sense. So um, there are 2.3 million people who are incarcerated in the United States. But we also need to add people who are on probation and parole. When you add the about 800,000 people who are on parole and about 4.5 million who are on probation at any given time, there's over 7 million Americans who are under some form of correctional control. Now, granted, parole and probation is a lot better than being in prison, but they're one step away. And that doesn't mean a new crime. That means a probation or parole violation, which might be missing an appointment with a parole officer. It might mean failing a drug test for a drug that's actually illegal. It might mean an illegal U-turn. And I even know somebody who got married and was thrilled to announce it to his probation officer who said, oh, you weren't allowed to do that without my permission, you're going back to prison. We have incredibly draconian probation and parole systems, something that's underappreciated. And so while a lot of times people talk about the 2.3 million incarcerated, I think it's important to realize that there's 7 million who are really on the edge of incarceration. Now, 15 million people touch the criminal justice system each year. And there's a big churn of people who are going in and out. And clearly, if that's happening, going in is not helping, right? Um, and then the lasting legacy and impact, 20 million Americans have felony convictions. And those stay with them. Those are largely permanent, with a few rare exceptions. So we have an enormous criminal justice system that affects so many among us. And when you put it all together, there are 100 million Americans have some kind of criminal record, which includes arrests and misdemeanor convictions. And as, I, as you all know, Google can always find those things. And so we are a country that has incarcerated so much, that has punished so much, that is essentially devouring its own people in some sense. Now, this isn't cheap. Um, when you put it all together, it costs taxpayers $183 billion a year in direct and indirect costs to have this massive incarceration system. And it's irrational and it serves no legitimate purpose. Um, the costs are just staggering. It costs more to incarcerate someone than it does to educate a child. And I want you to think about that because it's a set of priorities and decisions that have been made in this country, which is that we will pay huge amounts of funds of taxpayer money to incarcerate people while we will not spend that to educate children, right? And so there's a trade-off between those two. And these are some examples of states where you see the cost of incarceration. In New York, it's almost $70,000 a year per person, right? And we have some of the longest sentences in the world where people are incarcerated way beyond their period of dangerousness. There's a huge amount of literature about, first on juveniles, and many people who are juveniles are tried as adults and have really long sentences. Right. And second, just on general um, brain development and, and aging out of criminal activity. And many people who might be dangerous for a period of time and might have committed a crime for which they deserve to go to prison. But after 25 years, after 30 years, what are we doing when we're spending $70,000 a year to incarcerate someone? And we're also cutting education. Now, speaking of children, it's important to remember that 53% of people in prison are parents. And so there's this expression that gets said, which is that the family does the time too. And so when somebody goes to prison, you have to understand that there's also a spouse and there often are children and there are parents and those parents will get old and often die. And actually just today, I got one of the most heartbreaking messages that one of my former students from the DC jail, who's now in a federal prison, who's a great kid, someone I really, really believe in, who got an A in my class. His mother just died and he's not allowed to go to her funeral. And it just breaks my heart. And they were asking to see if there's any way I could help. And sadly, the answer is no, because the Federal Bureau of Prisons doesn't let people leave to go to funerals. Um, but more importantly, in larger terms, you have so many children who have a parent in prison and the effects are incredibly damaging. I've had multiple situations where there has been uh, a parent and a child at the same prison. And I even had a situation where there was a grandfather, son, and then grandson who were all incarcerated together and I knew all three of them. And it just makes me wonder what exactly are we doing when you're sentencing somebody to this long period of time, you're in a sense pre-sentencing the children to some degree. And that's just something we need to think about. Um, now, we need to also talk about the racial 
and to some extent gender uh, inequalities in the criminal justice system. And as I say in my Prisons and Punishment class, where we spend the first five sessions of the class talking about race, which is that race is at the center of every single element of criminal justice in America, from policing to arrest to prosecution to sentences to the conditions in prison and who goes to solitary confinement to who gets parole and to what life is like upon reentry. At every stage, there are tremendous racial disparities. But let's just look at it briefly here in some sense, where you look um, in terms of the likelihood of incarceration, where for African-American men, it's about one third about all African-American men will spend some time in prison in their lives. Now, when you actually add another element that's not on the chart, that those who have not completed high school, so African-American men who don't finish high school, don't have a high school degree, is nearly 80% chance of going to prison. It's almost a prison sentence in and of itself. And um, it's twice as high as the rate for Latino men, which is already very high. And it's six times higher for African Americans than it is for white men. Um, among women, and women are about 7% of the prison population overall, it's 93% male, but still it's a fast growing population. There are more and more women being sent to prison. Um, we see the same type of racial disparities where African American women are much more likely to be sentenced to prison. Um, so this is an inescapable reality. I think now we're living in a moment where more attention is being placed on this, but it is undeniable. Um, the facts don't lie. Walking into prison as I do, and I go to prisons all around the country, it hits you in the face wherever you go. The racial disparities, it's glaring and it's deeply troubling. When you also look at um, other socioeconomic factors like education and poverty, you see that there's a tremendous overrepresentation of people with low education or who are functionally illiterate, and then especially people um, who come from poverty. Um, it's, it's a staggering disparity, and it's something that makes you think about what are the causes of incarceration? Is it really a choice? Is it really a lifestyle? Is it really um, bad people? Or is it really bad circumstances that lead people to make these choices? I think it's important to look at the balance here, and, and the evidence certainly show these tremendous disparities. But here's what's important to remember. And if there's one statistic I hope you take away, is that 95% of incarcerated people will eventually return to society, right? So no matter what you think about anything that I've said or shown you so far, the reality is they will be coming home. And what I'd like you to get you to think about is who do you want them to be? Do you want them to be people who essentially have been held in cages and poked in the eye over and over and over for years, decades? Or do you want them to be people who have grown up, who have transformed, who have discovered new passions and interests and developed their talents and skills and who are ready to contribute to society. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what Georgetown's programs are trying to do. And I'll get to those in a few minutes. Finally, I just want to point out what's called the collateral consequences of incarceration. In the US, there's over 40,000 different consequences that make it difficult for someone after they have left prison you know this expression, you know, you, you, you've done your time or you've paid your debt to society? Well, in the US, your debt is never really paid because you have this whole series of consequences that make it incredibly difficult to have a meaningful life as a citizen. We're hearing a lot about it right now with the right to vote, where there's over 5 million Americans who don't have the right to vote, who can't vote in the 2020 presidential election because of a previous felony conviction, even though they're no longer in prison. Um, and there are all kinds of examples in employment. There are people who work in prison as barbers who are cutting hair, who are really skilled at it. And then they get out and they're not allowed to get hired in a barber shop because it involves using scissors and they have a criminal record for maybe selling drugs 20 years earlier. Totally irrational. In California, you have these wildfires and they're using firefighters who are incarcerated, who actually leave the prison for the day, fight fires in some of the most dangerous conditions. Many of them are women actually. There's a huge troop of, of incarcerated female firefighters. And then when they get released after they've served their time, they cannot get hired by that very same fire department where they've been working tirelessly and risking their lives. They can't get hired because they have a criminal record. There are all kinds of examples of it that are incredibly irrational. So now I'm gonna stop my screen sharing for a moment um, and come back to you. Uh, and then I wanna to turn to some um, short videos that I wanna show. So 
I've just thrown a lot of broad national and international statistics at you. And I hope it wasn't overwhelming. I hope it was engaging. For those of you who've been out of college for a long time, I hope it brought you back uh, to feeling like you were in a college class for a minute. Uh, but now I wanna hone in onto the hilltop. And I wanna tell you what Georgetown is doing to help change this terrible system and reality. So the Prisons and Justice Initiative was founded in 2016. Um, initially, it was thanks to some seed funding for the first two years from the president's office. But since then, we've expanded thanks to some generous alumni donors and some grants that we've received. And very quickly, we've established ourselves as the country's leading university-based criminal justice and prison reform organization. And honestly, I can say without any hesitation that there is no university in the country, or frankly in the world, that is doing so much to change and improve the criminal justice and prison systems. So I wanna give you um, some brief summaries of our three main programs. But rather than have me tell you about it in my own words, I wanna show a few short videos that will actually bring them to life in a much more powerful way. Because ultimately, this isn't about statistics and this isn't about a professor trying to convince you of anything. It's about people. It's about our fellow human beings. And so I wanna start um, with the Making an Exoneree program. And this goes back to Marty and you're gonna see Marty in this short video. And this is a class that we teach. We're about to start the third version of it in the spring. We teach it every spring. And we have our students work on real live wrongful conviction cases. Now, first off, I need to say that these are undergraduate students. Um, the media coverage of our class always gets it wrong and calls them law students. They somehow can't resist. But these are undergraduate students. They're ages you know, 18 to 22 and they take up cases that are some of the hardest cases where people have lost hope, where they've been incarcerated for a long time and they have little opportunity to get their story out. And we take on these cases and we reinvestigate them. And that involves going to the crime scene, that involves talking to witnesses, talking to family members, talking to the original prosecutor, talking to the original defense attorney, doing everything possible to try to figure out what actually happened. And in each of those cases, our students do an extraordinary job in developing a much more convincing and I think realistic understanding of what happened. Now that doesn't mean we're gonna get everybody out who we believe was wrongfully convicted, but in so many cases, we've managed to get now legal representation. We've managed to get a lot of interest and awareness about this case. And so this is a class that is really having an impact on people's lives in the real world and those who are stuck in prison and shouldn't be there. But now I'm gonna share my screen again and I'm gonna show you uh, a sizzle reel from a documentary that is being made about this program. Wrongful convictions, it's an epidemic. It's not isolated to one race. Uh, it affects poor people, it affects wealthy people, black, white. The criminal justice system doesn't work like it does on law and order or CSI. Or huge numbers of mistakes are being made every day. Not everybody who's behind bars belongs there. Innocent until proven guilty is a great ideal if we could actually live up to it, but the sad reality is that we don't. I spent 11 years in prison based on hearsay. Every day in prison is a bad day. friends since I think it was three or four years old. We grew up together from lovey-dovey preschool and you know we continue to joke that you know uh, Mark went to Yale and I went to jail. Marty himself uh, was wrongfully convicted when we were his seniors in high school. His parents were murdered. He was convicted of murdering his parents. And I'd always believed that he was innocent. And finally, I got involved in, with his legal team and eventually it took him 17 and a half years, but we were able to prove his innocence. 6,338 days I was in prison before I was finally released on December 27, 2007. So when Mark asked me to teach a class at Georgetown, in a weird way, I thought it was crazy because it was kind of like out of the blue. We started talking about it and I go, are you serious? He goes, yeah. And what ends up happening? You end up in prison. And Marty coming down here and being a co-professor with me for this course and for the goal of trying to get other people, other Martys, if you will, out of prison is just tremendous and really exciting.
think America sees itself as such a gold standard in terms of human rights and justice, and then you see these instances where the system has so incredibly failed someone. I absolutely believe in John Moss's innocence. It's so just obvious that he didn't do it. How anybody ever got a conviction out of this, I, I have no idea. It's a textbook example of a, a coerced confession or a false confession case. They didn't even find the murder weapon. They didn't. There was nothing that really linked, like forensically linked Kenneth to the crime the night of the murder. There's a door on the back of the house. They found blood pooling in the front bedroom and then supposedly dragged her to the back bedroom diagonal across the house. So this is probably it. So the shooter was coming from East Coal Spring Lane that way, tried to rob Terrence McCoy over here, and there's the guardrail. A couple of weeks before Justin Baumgartner was murdered, he filed a police report saying that a green Ford had tried to run him off the road. John confessed. He was repeatedly punched by Trooper Smith, is what he said, and basically like, if you don't say you did this, if you don't confess, this is where they'll find your body. When they accused me of this, like, it hit me so hard, right? It, it just killed me. You know, and I figured that it would all work itself out. When they gave me 39 years or whatever he gave me, I was just, I, I think I was in space. Well, two things both of you keep saying is there's no physical evidence. What physical evidence should there have been? This is a shooting on there the street. Was, um, Valentino's clothes were taken into evidence and his hands were tested for gunshot residue and then none of that evidence was presented in court. What was your perception of Monfried, his defense lawyer, at the time of the trial? He was, um, you know, a seasoned, mm -hmm. you know, well thought of attorney. He actually fell asleep during the trial. A lot of attorneys listen with their eyes closed. These are lawyers who, you know, take oaths to, to uphold their, their uh, oaths to their profession. And they cheat, steal, hide evidence. They are never going to budge on his on his being guilty and we're just students. So it's gonna be hard to convince all of these people that we're right and they're wrong. Would you happen to know where, um, or who the people who live in apartment B are? I was never 100% sure that Kenneth Bond was the person that I saw that evening. His life should not have been taken away from him based on the testimony that I provided. This isn't just a class. This isn't just about wrongful convictions. This is about people's lives. The Holy Grail for us would obviously be one of our five cases, one of the five people we believe were wrongfully convicted, getting out, getting exonerated, and coming home. hearing his family cheering, clapping. I just felt overwhelmed. I just felt so happy for him and hopeful that this experience can happen again with his class and with other people who have been wrongfully convicted. This doing this gave me the most hope that I've ever felt in 27 years. When the students got on board, it was like, this is gonna happen. The minute I mentioned Georgetown, they said, oh, you're going home. Nobody had any doubt. You know, nobody had any reservations. Honestly, for this to happen is an out of this world experience for me. It seems almost miraculous in this. I don't know about you, but I get goosebumps watching that, even though I've seen it many times and was a part of it. Um, to think that Valentina would still be in prison, um, if not for our class and our students, um, is extraordinary. And some of the other cases that I've covered there, um, we have hope. We have the Innocence Project that's joined forces with us. And um, mark my words, we will have more exonerations coming. Um, now I want to transition um, to a different program, the Prison Scholars Program, um, where we provide uh, our courses, um, initially non-credit and then credit-bearing courses at the DC jail. Um, and 
as I mentioned, every time I go inside, I feel so inspired by, by the courage, by the dignity, by the character, by the dedication of our incarcerated students. And I could go on and on about it, but I wanna show you now a short video that focuses on three individuals and gives you a sense of our program and why we do it. And I want you to know that this, what you're about to see, this is what I think about when I think of the humanity of incarcerated people and their potential to contribute to society. So I'm gonna um, go out of this one and go to um, this video. Education has changed the trajectory of my life. It has given me a reason to breathe. It has given me purpose as a human being. In January 2018, the Prisons and Justice Initiative launched a pilot education program at the DC jail. We offered a variety of non-credit courses in the spring 2018 and summer 2018 semesters. In September 2018, thanks to two generous donors, we added two credit-bearing courses per semester. We also have the only co-educational prison education program in the country. This celebration marks the end of a great semester with both credit and non-credit classes as we honor the power of education to transform people's lives, families, and communities. At one point, I, I always thought that I didn't really have a voice. A structure formed itself around my life that I couldn't shape. And it wound me here in prison. A life of crime is is something that a lot of people do when they are ignorant to survive. I entered this jail uh, when I was 16 years old, a self-destructive, traumatized child who I could barely read and write. I returned 26 years later. It's George Tanscar. educated and you have the know-how, you have the tools to succeed, a life of crime isn't even an option anymore. You know, you see better ways, you, see, you have more opportunities open up to you. My goal is to be a doctor in sociology and to be a professor. I wrote this poem for this event and it's called You Ask Me. You ask me what I've learned in democracy. I've learned that the greatest hypocrisy is that democracy isn't something that we should fight wars and kill for, because democracy is something that we should all strive to live for. Prison is not rehabilitative. Education is. Education is the very element that rehabilitates us. Each semester, we're offering two credit-bearing courses along with six to eight non-credit courses. And the response has been overwhelmingly positive. So we want to go further. Our goal is to expand our course offerings, enroll more students in our program, and create a vibrant educational community and culture at the DC Jail. It'll take more outside support to achieve our goal, but I can say that our students are working extremely hard, they're making incredible progress, and they're truly performing at the college level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. For more information and to support the Scholars Program, please visit prisonsandjustice.georgetown.edu. So um, I need to move on to the next program, but I just hope that that gives you an illustration of something I tell my Georgetown students all the time, which is that intelligence and education are two different things. Sometimes they overlap and they work together, but many of the smartest people I've ever met, and many of the best students I've ever had, also dropped out of school in eighth grade. And they, through a long, difficult journey, found their education much later in life while incarcerated. And this program is something that gives them hope and gives meaning and provides value to their families um, and really helps to make our community safer and better. Um, I now wanna to turn to the last program that I wanna discuss, which is the PIVOT program, which is actually an education program for formerly incarcerated people, for returning citizens after they've left prison. 
This is the first of its kind. Georgetown is the only university that has done a, a year long program. It's in partnership with our uh, McDonough School of Business. Dean Paul Almeida and Vice Dean Pietro Rivoli are, are extraordinary partners in this. And we've been able to um, get support from both alumni and several grants to allow this program to take off and thrive. Um, but rather than me explain it to you, I'm gonna show a quick video that's three minutes that um, will give you a sense of the pivot program. And then I wanna make sure that we have time um, for some Q&A before we end our session. I remember being 16 years old when I had my GED. I'm gonna go to college and then have my bachelor's before I turn 23 or 24, and that was the plan. But you know, due to a few bad decisions that I made, that didn't come out. So to be back on college campus, pursuing the education, it was like, this is where I was supposed to be. We have a mass incarceration crisis in this country where we have 2.3 million people locked up behind bars. And especially in a place like D.C. where, you know, 5,000 people are returning to the community every year. Very few universities and institutions are doing enough about it. And so Georgetown is taking the lead. The Pivot Program is a partnership between the Prisons and Justice Initiative and the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University, where we educate and help support formerly incarcerated individuals to become business leaders and entrepreneurs. No, or not right now, or we don't need to. Those are the words that we all hear. I have two master's degrees, but once I had that criminal history status, I couldn't even get a job at Safeway bagging groceries. I knew I had some skill, but I've never used these skills in society. By emphasizing entrepreneurship, we are giving them the, the tools to think about their future, to navigate their way through those issues, and to create a, a better future for themselves. They give you classes in liberal arts, they teach you about business, they teach you about accounting, and they really challenge you to think about what does it really look like, and what, and what do people who are successful in business really go through? Presentation, delivery, pitches, interaction, networking, all that is a part of entrepreneurship. And I learned all that through Pivot. I have two internships, but the first one was Common Cause. I conduct research and write blogs for them on the topics of mass incarceration, felony disenfranchisement, and prison gerrymandering. We are working with the city of D.C., Department of Employment Services. They're giving us uh, not only funding, but also um, job coaches and support. And also the federal government's Minority Business Development Agency, which has given us a federal grant to support our program. We're really proud of our Pivot Fellows. They learned a lot, they came a long way, and they're helping to reshape the narrative, showing that people are greater than the worst thing they've ever done and are capable of success. Pivot is in a class by itself in terms of a program for reentry. You're gonna have connections to people you virtually don't know based on where you went to school. But it will take long-term partnerships with employers, with individuals who will support our program for it to succeed in the long term. This program is really about the difference between second chance and second class. This is a group of people who really want to create a different future for themselves and for their families. And we can give them that opportunity. Going through the criminal justice system it was a bad experience, but it doesn't dictate how I have to finish. I wouldn't trade in my experience for anything. I treasure and I relish in it. So who knows what the future is? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. Um, but I hope that uh, what I've shown you today, and I know I had to race through a few things, but I hope that it's moved you, I hope it's inspired you, and I hope it's made you feel proud about your connection to Georgetown. Um, there's more that I could say about the challenges of COVID and how we've adjusted to it. Um, we've been able to keep our classes going inside with tablets. Uh, it's been difficult. We've been able to continue the pivot program. We were able to have a graduation in June. We moved from in March to um, all virtual classes. Very difficult with the returning citizen population that doesn't have the comfort with technology. Um, we're starting a third cohort of pivot fellows starting in early November. We're in the final stages of recruiting right now and admissions. Um, there's so much that we're doing. COVID has made it very challenging, um, especially for people who are incarcerated. But 
um, we're just redoubling our efforts to try to support them and try to continue the, the work that we're doing. And the same goes for making an exoneree. Uh, we're going to hold our class, even if it's an all virtual environment, as it looks like it probably will be. Um, and there's still a lot that we can do. So um, I'm going to now um, let Kayla jump in with some of the questions um, that may have been coming through. And I'd be happy to uh, engage uh, with, with anyone who wants to follow up. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Howard, um, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I speak for myself and I'm sure everyone else here on the call today. I really enjoyed uh, everything that you presented us with. As you mentioned, we do want to jump right into Q&A uh, and we have had quite a few questions come in. Um, I think we can really just start here uh, and you kind of touched on this just a moment ago, uh, but one question reads regarding COVID-19, what legal obligations do the different prison systems have to keep inmates safe and healthy? Well, sadly, almost none. Um, and the infection rate in prisons has been almost universal. Um, there's been very little testing, but in the places that have done testing, they found infection rates going from 50 to 90%. And this was even in, in April. So um, prisons by definition are places where um, there's no um, social distancing possible, where hand sanitizer is considered contraband, um, where masks weren't available for many, many, many months. Um, and I should also add that correctional officers um, had very high rates of COVID infection. And that's typically where it came in and then spread. Um, there have been innumerable infections. There have been thousands of deaths. Um, and it's sad because it, it was preventable. It was known there were people sounding the alarm bells, but sadly not enough was done to keep people um, separate to allow people um, to have home release. There's a lot of home confinement that's possible. Some jurisdictions did it and I really applaud them for that. Um, but um, far too many people um, got sick and we're all waiting um, for this nightmare to end um, as we are on the outside, but on the inside, trust me, it's even worse. I mean, they've been essentially locked in cells. It's the equivalent of solitary confinement, but for everybody. And it's, it's not a way to live, it's not a way to progress, it's not a way to prepare. And so I hope that, that there's something we learn from. And what we're able to provide through the tablets, through the content that we're sharing is at least some kind of a lifeline that hopefully um, will sustain people you know, intellectually and emotionally so that they keep hanging on. Um, but it's something that uh, we're really committed to, to continuing no matter what uh, comes in front of us. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, let's see, it reads, congrats on all three excellent programs. Does the Prisons and Justice Initiative have any programming that deals with re-educationing, the re-education of parole, probation officers, prisons guards, et cetera, uh, which seem to be another part of the current problem? Yeah, that's tricky. Um, we are fortunate in DC, we work with a very supportive um, correctional uh, administration that not only tolerates us, but supports us and really works with us. And so um, they have embraced, uh, for example, a language of not using the term inmates and using the term residents, of being respectful towards them. And many people um, who are in our program, some of whom have been incarcerated for, for decades, and are back in DC because of a new issue in their case. The thing is when you're from DC, you get sent into the Federal Bureau of Prisons and gets shipped all around the country. But when they are back in DC for a motion on their case, which is the case for a lot of people who are juvenile lifers who went to prison as juveniles. And they say they've never had uh, the possibility of programming like they do now with us. And then also they've never been treated in such a positive way and respectful way and how, how important that is for changing their whole redefinition of themselves. Um, so that's something that uh, we would love to be able to work with correctional staff more. Um, it's delicate though, because we don't wanna just barge in and say, you're doing everything wrong. You need to redo everything. Um, but we'd like to work in terms of, of modeling respectful behavior and really engaging. And we always encourage um, correctional staff to sit in on our classes and many of them do. There's some who ask to be you know, on a shift that has them you know, in our classrooms because they 
um, learn. And there's even a few who work in groups with incarcerated people, which is almost unheard of. So we're really trying to encourage just connecting on a human level and really leaving the past behind, leaving the uniform or, or jumpsuit or whatever behind and just um, embracing our own uh, shared humanity. Thank you. Uh, next question. Are there any opportunities available to volunteer with either the Prison Scholars Program or the Pivot Program? Uh, sure. Now, it's tricky right now with the COVID phase um, because there's not much we can do going inside. Everything's virtual. Um, and so I think that is kind of on pause right now. Uh, we do have a lot of interest from uh, an overwhelming amount of interest from students actually. So it kind of depends on somebody's uh, individual location and, and time and availability. Um, but we are looking to engage with a, a larger network and certainly of alumni um, to help out with our, our work in different ways. And so there's the website prisonsandjustice.georgetown.edu also has a volunteer form that people can fill out. Just be patient knowing that right now there's not much that unfortunately we can do um, with volunteers given that we're in an all virtual environment. But um, soon, hopefully this will be over and we'll be um, back to normal and really being able to, to help in person. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, an alum shares that they've never been more proud or inspired to be a Georgetown alum. Are there any plans to expand the program outside of the DC area? Uh, they mentioned that we need these programs in Arizona. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, we won't be able to expand our in-person programming outside of the DC area. We're expanding into Maryland and we hope at some point someday into Virginia too. But beyond that, a big part, and it's ironic I'm saying this in a COVID environment on a webinar, but it's really hard to be able to connect and develop trust and bonds with incarcerated people unless you're in person. And we're able to do it with our scholars who are continuing in the program because they know us, but it's very hard to do from scratch just through a screen, especially when you're talking about a population that really many of them haven't even had access to screens. And so it's a challenge to do that. We do have a lot of interest from, uh, and I get a lot of mail, I get so much prison mail and prison phone calls, you can't even imagine. But there are a lot of requests to um, expand our programs elsewhere or even for DC residents who are incarcerated elsewhere. Um, but we really view the in-person quality of the education that we're providing as, as being so critical that we don't want to just sort of, you know, put on a few videos and then send it in and think that that's um, Georgetown quality. So um, that I will say that with my nonprofit, the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice, um, we will be having prison visitation, which will include um, sit down conversations with incarcerated people who are really so extraordinary. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to um, expand into Arizona and in other, uh, all over the country um, in the coming years. Again, as soon as COVID passes, we have a, a very ambitious plan to really um, allow people wherever they are in the country to have the opportunity to connect with the humanity of incarcerated people. Thank you. Uh, and our last question that we'll be able to share this afternoon, considering that the majority of the program beneficiaries are black, what are, what are the efforts to ensure Black leadership within the program personnel on the university side, as well as a Black student participation? Yeah, that's something that um, I believe in very strongly is important to be able to model um, the, uh, in your own organization what you're um, hoping to impress upon your, your students um, and your participants. And that's something, um, certainly in, in the Douglas Project, we have a new uh, Chief Operating Officer, Brian Ferguson, um, who's African-American, who's a Georgetown alumnus. And um, within Georgetown, we have um, uh, an increasing diversity in our um, hires, um, but it's something that you know, we recognize is, is um, an area that really needs um, to be addressed. And so um, I, I hear where the question is coming from and, and I take it very seriously. Okay. 
thank you so much, Professor Howard. Uh, a large appreciation as well for answering as many questions as we could this afternoon. I know you're extremely busy. Um, so again, we do appreciate you taking the time to host this lecture series with us. Um, and again, thank you to everyone, all the participants who were able to join and stay on for Q&A. Um, please tune in tomorrow. We do have two additional homecoming lecture series courses being taught, but again, thank you so much, Professor Howard. Thank you all for joining and thank you, Kayla, for moderating. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.